Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Anne Marie Hughes, and I am a 10 year pancreatic cancer survivor. Thanks a lot to my guest here today, Dr. Charles Yeo. Hi, Dr. Yeo. Hello, Anne Marie. Great to see you. I can't believe it's been a decade. I can't either, but you told me I would be here. Well, it's very gratifying to see someone doing well 10 years out from pancreas surgery. Remember, Emory, there are many people in America don't even know the pancreas exists. So there's, a, there's an education gap. And uh, you've been the beneficiary not only of surgery, but other treatments that have helped you along the way. So truth be told, it's just not been the surgeon's scalpel. That's true. Um, and one of the benefits that we have here in Philadelphia is that our doctors all work together, no matter what the institution. Tell us how you came to be a pancreatic cancer surgeon. I was attracted to the field of surgery. There wasn't much pancreatic surgery being done at the time. I'd say there are two important things that happened in my, in my life. Number one, um, I was offered the opportunity to get a, what's called a clinician scientist award. Part of that clinician scientist award, um, I got to see something called the NIH guide. They realized that pancreatic cancer was sort of a poor stepchild. So they wanted to give people money to study pancreatic cancer. So I saw that I pulled together a group of people that are way smarter than me, uh, including Ralph Ruban and Elizabeth Jaffe and others. And we wrote an NIH grant called Correlates and Treatment of Pancreatic Cancer. It was funded in about 1990, 1991. It was for several million dollars. And we were able to put the genetics of pancreatic cancer on the map. And part of that came with the work that John Cameron, who I'd have to say is my most important mentor, was, was at that point just really starting to build a very large practice of, of uh, surgeons um, operating on patients with pancreatic tumors. So it's that convergence that led me um, to focus more attention in, uh, in pancreas domains. It's been a great great career for the last now over three decades. I'm given the opportunity to operate on thousands and thousands of patients with pancreatic tumor. I got a chance to train literally hundreds of medical students, dozens of fellows, residents, work with really smart faculty members. Plus I get to work with my wife. My wife got her PhD in epidemiology of pancreatic cancer and Every week, my wife and I see patients together. We talk about pancreatic cancer. So I, I feel very, very fortunate. And I don't think I could have had a career that would be as satisfying uh, to me, so. It's a, it's a grueling surgery. You don't see many out of shape pancreatic surgeons. <laughs> that's for sure. The lady, I, the, the gal I did yesterday, um, it was about a 10 hour operation. Some people, uh, the surgery can take three or four hours. It's a competition. The competition is between the cancer uh, and, and us. You know, can we safely remove the cancer and give the patient an opportunity for cure? And uh, that keeps you going. No early detection yet. What do you see on the horizon for that? Think of the resources that were put in to COVID worldwide. And obviously, you know, killing five, five million plus people thus far. So um, deservedly resources were put there. Um, as we continue to study pancreatic cancer as uh, the NIH and other uh, funding mechanisms continue to fund, there will be a breakthrough. There's excitement around um, circulating tumor DNA. Um, there are problems with that technology. Um, it's probably not going to be the, um, the holy grail. Um, and as the, the tumor cells sort of live in a protective cocoon, if you will, I think we're probably a new technology away for, for screening the population. One of the things that people talk about um, is doing chemo and radiation ahead of surgery. Have you seen a lot of success with that approach? Uh, especially if 
the stroma exists and makes it difficult to break the barrier to that tumor? We don't have the full answer to a surgery first approach versus an, what you're referring to a neoadjuvant chemo, chemo radiation approach. Um, and there's actually pros and cons to both sides. I think you have to uh, recognize that for most patients, when pancreatic cancer is diagnosed, it's not early. There are things called circulating tumor DNA. Um, the tumors can metastasize relatively early. And so there's an advantage for many people to get systemic therapy up front to diminish the risk of subsequent metastatic disease and then to resect the tumor. But I don't think that's necessarily the best option for everyone. And we do a survivor photo every year at our symposium. And it is, you know, getting a hundred plus people together for as survivors of pancreatic cancer, it's a wonderful feeling. There are many people in that audience um, who opted not to get chemotherapy, not to get radiation therapy, had their surgery up front and are still alive five, 10, 15 years later. So, um, it, you know, it's not black or white and you have to do what, what, you, uh, what you think is correct, uh, what's best for the patients. We still have more to learn. We need big um, randomized controlled trials. Um, I think there'll be some subgroups who clearly should be treated with upfront therapy before surgery. There's, there may very well be some subgroups who the outcomes will be identical. Um, depending on what order you do it. So more, more to come, but we are so blessed that we do have much more in the way of um, active drugs than we did years ago. Although most of the regimens, for example, fulfirinox, you know, fulfirinox regimen, which is the, one of the main regimens, that was not designed specifically for pancreatic cancer. I think it's important that we continue to study drugs and particularly a shout out has to go to PANCAN for the Know Your Tumor initiative, which was initiated years ago. And the publications on that, are, are, I mean, the data on that are very, very impressive. That is, if the, if, if the patient has a tumor that contains an actionable mutation and you can align the therapy with the mutation, the outcome is likely to be much better. And we have very good data along that line. Now, what we have to do is get to the point where 100% of patients' tumors are studied, and we can identify in 100% of patients their most optimal treatment, give them truly personalized treatment. We're not there yet. What excites you? about this field? Number one, we've made great progress. The five-year overall survival rate's gone from two to 10%. By the same token, what a great field for young people to go into. There's still incredible room to move the needle. Many things in this field that deserve the attention of really smart young people. You alluded to one before, early detection. Another is better understanding the familial inheritance patterns that come with pancreatic cancer. Another would be identifying novel drugs, whether they're chemotherapeutics, immunologics, or other classes of drugs. I'd love to encourage more and more young people to consider the treatment of pancreatic cancer, whether it's medical oncology, radiation oncology, immunotherapy, surgery, or even the palliative care domain, quality of life issues. There's a lot still that we, that we need to accomplish to help our patients. But we've done a lot better. We're doing a lot better. And there can be long-term survival. It can, with a good quality of life, return to essentially normal activities and have a lot to look forward to. This particular interview means the world to me because um, I consider you not only my surgeon, but my, my friend, and I'm so grateful um, to know you.